Welcome to A Healthy Curiosity, the podcast that explores what it takes to be well in a busy world with self-care strategies from Chinese medicine. I'm your host, Brody Welch, here to support you on your journey of health, happiness, and personal evolution. Before we kick things off today, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Raising Health, who left me an excellent five-star review in iTunes. It starts, just what the world needs. What an inspiring message of how to navigate in this busy and chaotic world by getting clear and focused on what actually matters. Thank you for giving us the tools to change the way we think and act. Bravo. And thank you, Raising Health, for taking the time to help other people find their way to the show because it is really hard to get noticed out there. And there's a lot of people who need this information that my guests so generously deliver on a healthy curiosity. So if you've been meaning to leave a review, please make time in your calendar, head over to iTunes and just drop me a line or two. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Brody Welch. And today we're going to be talking about the MTHFR gene, genetic mutation, and what we could do about it. My guest today is Dr. Kendra Becker-Musante. She is an integrated physician practicing in Connecticut for over a decade. She is a 4A specialist, those 4As being asthma, autism, allergies, and atopy, or eczema. She holds a naturopathic degree, and she is passionate about the effects of environmental toxins on our lives, as well as fertility and treatment of the 4As someone who I think has a lot of wisdom to share, and I'm delighted to have her on the show today. Welcome, Dr. Kendra Becker. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, Brody. Thanks so much for the invitation. I know that a lot of people are getting more into this idea of recognizing that genetic mutations can have an effect on our health. Our lives don't have to be dictated by our genetics, that there's actually quite a lot we can do to figure out how they impact our lives. So could you start us off with, first of all, what the heck is the MTHFR gene and why is it important? Sure, absolutely. You took the words right out of my mouth. Lately, especially, you know, pharmaceutical companies and advertisements and all kinds of things have really brought us to this hyper focus of genetics. But the truth of the matter is, is is we are all genetically diverse. I mean, that's part of the nature of the human race and why we've evolved and, and, and survived for as long as we have. So I think that's absolutely part of it is we need to, you know, celebrate diversity. Not that, you know what I mean? It sounds kind of cliche, but I mean, really celebrate our diversity. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's some force to be reckoned with as far as genetics, in spite of the fact that they don't define us. But MTHFR is a gene that it's an abbreviation for um, methyl tetrahydroxyfolate reductase. So basically, it's an enzyme. And, you know, enzymes, as we know, are catalysts to almost every body reaction. And so the reason that there's been a lot of hyper-focus around MTHFR, particularly in the medical literature in the last few years, is because this particular enzyme breaks down folic acid, which we know is synthetic. Folic acid is made in a lab. It's not something that's found in nature or in natural food. And it converts folic acid into the usable form of folate, which is called methylfolate. What we have been discovering and what you know modern science has led us to is about 60% of the American population have this genetic mutation, which means 60% of the population can't convert synthetic folic acid into the usable form of folate. And as you know, all the literature that you get in your OB's office or at the cancer doctor or whatever is, you know, take your folic acid. What's happened over time in medicine is that we've interchanged the word folic acid and folate to mean basically the same thing. And clearly they're very, very different. Folate is the kind that's found in nature. Folic acid is the kind made in a lab, correct? Exactly correct. And if we're not taking folic acid in a vitamin form, should we even care? Well... Yes and no, because the problem is, is number one, folic acid is found in things that we're not, that people aren't generally aware of. For example, 100% of enriched products that we see, whether it be flowers or sometimes granola bars or whatever, are all enriched with synthetic folic acid. It was- um, (laughs) Enriched is such a funny word, right? Like, let's strip away the natural goodness that these grains have and like enrich the remaining flour products with synthetic stuff that- 60% of the population might actually have a problem figuring out. (laughs) Welcome to my life. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> and you know, I'm one of those doctors that sits there and scrapes their their scratches their head like, yes, we've become the society that we have to label organic food, but the stuff with the poison in it, that's cool. All you need is a pretty label. Right. So, and I think it it does come down to you have to really really know what you're eating. Just curious. So, if someone is eating a standard American diet that includes processed food that have been, you know, enriched with folic acid, what kinds of health implications could there be for that person? What might that person be experiencing that they might not have any idea is connected to their genetics or to even their diet? Here's where the struggle is between holistic medicine and conventional medicine, because MTHFR is part of our methylation cycle. Methylation is part of how our body detoxes toxins. So the truth of the matter is almost every symptom that you're seeing that your patients are presenting with could actually be related to MTHFR. The most common ones, however, are generally, and we'll just go from the top down, you know, like good naturopaths do, right? Headaches, brain fog, you know, low energy, depression, anxiety, uh, thyroid problems, uh, problems with digestion, problems with fertility, problems with bowels, problems with skin, problems with asthma, problems with adrenals. That sure covers yes. most people that I see in my practice. <laughs> yes. Yeah, see what I'm saying? I've become really hyper-specialized over the years because I just think this is so, so important is that if we don't heal the body and balance methylation, the rest of the healing is going to be so challenging for that individual because this is basically the foundation of how your body metabolizes toxins. So we know that people that are positive for MTHFR are much more highly susceptible to oxidative stress. A simple definition of of oxidative stress is toxicity in our environment, you know, things we can't control, you know, the pollution because my office is on a main road or the chemicals in the new car you just bought. You know, those are things that people that have an impaired ability to detox can really struggle with. And those things can actually lead to health challenges for them. And that's not the kind of thing where like somebody gets a, that we're not talking about chemical sensitivity where somebody gets into the car and they immediately get a headache. They feel terrible. The effects could be a lot more subtle than that, I imagine. Exactly. You know, as a naturopath, I really support that, you know, the toxic bucket effect, like we all have a bucket and we fill it drip by drip over the, you know, weeks, years and months of our lives. And we're never, ever sure what that last drip is going to be that's going to tip over our bucket and really implicate our health. And that I think is the biggest takeaway message for patients with MTHFR. And the bulk of my practice is pediatrics. So I always start with my families and say, I have a beautiful medicinary, you know, you're more than welcome to come on back and take a look and, and see what I have back there. But the truth of the matter is, is if you have the luxury and the opportunity of having this knowledge when you have young children and mitigating these things from very early on, that that is what is really going to ensure a quality, you know, health quality throughout a lifespan, for sure. Makes so much sense to get kids off on the right foot because we do live in a toxic world despite our best efforts to avoid toxins. They really are everywhere. And in terms of that, the body's battle between nutrients and toxins and our ability to shed what we don't need anymore, like just being recognizing if you do have this genetic mutation, that there is something you can do about it. There are actions that you take. So I'm curious if you could share a little bit about what actions those might be. As a naturopath, what do we do? We heal the gut, right? So we, or in little kids, we try not to wreck the gut. So yes, the, <laughs> right, exactly. So the best way to do that, it's really simple. It's clean eating. You know, one of the biggest problems with folic acid in somebody who's positive for MTHFR is folic acid is sticky, right? And so it actually sticks in those receptors that are supposed to be communicating with the circulatory system to get nutrients inside the cell. So not only are you struggling with trying to get usable folate inside the cell, but you're also struggling with quite a few other B vitamins, right? And so if we can avoid gumming up, for lack of a better word, those receptors, we have a much better chance of keeping nutritional levels and nutrients much higher in people who possibly could be susceptible to oxidative stress. So clean eating, it comes clean back, eating. it comes back to that, which, um, which Doesn't is, it well, yeah, like it, it's, it's, um, I don't think there's any expert I've ever had on the show who thinks it's fine to just eat, you know, eat whatever you want. <laughs> right. Like, it is. And in Chinese medicine, of course, we think about the, well, at least the earth school in Chinese medicine, that digestive system is the foundation for all of our usable energy and that and, and our ability to think and our ability to support everything that the body needs 
to be nourished. So yes, it is absolutely central. And so just, and especially like, even if just as a start, it's taking out refined flour and refined sugar, that that in my mind is probably the most important fix from the standard American diet. Would you agree with that? Or do you put uh, something else first? Nope, a hundred percent. And you probably are well aware, and as are your listeners, is you know, number one, sugar we know paralyzes the immune system, right? We need the B vitamins, mostly the folate and the B12 for proper cell signaling of the immune system and neurotransmitter production. Both things are manufactured in the gut, right? And you know, with all the beautiful microbiome research that has come out in the last few years, we now know that the microbiome is as unique individual as a fingerprint is the same in the gut as it is in the brain. So back 5,000 years into Chinese medicine and basically get the same scenario. As far as grains go, and now not all grains are evil and not all grains are treated you know, equally, as we all know. And tr- quite honestly, not all human bodies are treated equally because there are some people who tolerate grains without any issue and some who will look at a quarter of a cup of rice and gain five pounds. So there is a, a unique bio-individuality, particularly that I've seen in my patients with grains. But in some people who are really struggling with their health, immune issues, digestive issues, issues with brain fog, d- depression, brain, and, and emotional such things, a lot of times pulling out those grains and reducing the inflammation and being able to heal the gut has been immeasurably beneficial. Really good information, right? That we're not all the same and do it, right. running that experiment on yourself could be, well be worth it. I'm curious about alcohol. I am definitely in the Puritan camp when it comes to alcohol. Just because of my work with genetics, I can tell you overwhelmingly that that more of my patients do not have the ability to break down alcohol. So alcohol basically breaks down into acetaldehyde, which we know is toxic. Now we know if they're positive for MTHFR and a whole host of other genetic polymorphisms or gene variety, that it is quite impossible for many people to break down alcohol. Also, there's quite a bit of the population has as a flush, you know, they can actually have an alcohol flush and there's also genetics for that. So I am personally of the camp that the least amount of alcohol you can drink, the better. And generally people that have a small amount of alcohol very infrequently are the ones that pay for it most dearly. But we also know that alcohol is the first thing in the liver that gets turned to carbohydrates. And so it becomes easy, quick energy because it's just so toxic to the body that you get these toxic byproducts and you get carbohydrates and the body just doesn't know what to do with it. So then you can end up with other conditions such as fatty liver. So I generally, for me, say stay away from it. And if you're going to consume alcohol, it's very, very infrequent and stick with the purest form of some sort of hard liquor. And for my patients, I generally say tequila, largely because it tends to have the least amount of metabolites, which causes the least amount of issues with metabolism for, for people that are sensitive. I appreciate you getting into that because a lot of times, even people who are like eating clean diets, they're drinking wine every night or, you know, it's something like that, which it can obviously be a massive factor. You know, the problem with wine is multifactorial. Number one, even if you're drinking organic wine, all the California wine right now, the conventional wine is so oversprayed that the glyphosate is actually being found in the organic California wine. So even though it's labeled organic, the farms have been certified when it comes down to the end product, the end product is technically not organic because of what the other farmers are doing. And number two, wine is the most difficult thing for a woman's body to actually metabolize, largely because women, of course, will have higher levels of hormone than men because of estrogen, menstrual cycles, progesterone, and things like that. And so the wine actually becomes what we call a gastric overburden. So if you're going to drink, stay the heck away from that. (laughs) Fascinating. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, Sorry, ladies. (laughs) This episode of A Healthy Curiosity is brought to you by Dow Labs. Dow Labs is a supplement and lifestyle company that's putting a modern spin on the ancient practice of Chinese herbal medicine. They've modernized classic Chinese herbal formulas by combining unique flavor combinations that mix easily with water, so you can take them with you when you're on the go. Dow Labs has formulas for immunity, for digestive health, emotional balance, and PMS, and they use sustainably sourced herbs that they package and test in the United States. And if you're a fellow acupuncturist, you might want to check out Dow Wellness's Ambassador Program, a unique wholesale approach to upgrading your herbal practice without getting bogged down in inventory. Visit mydowlabs.com for more information. That's M-Y-D-A-O-L-A-B-S dot com and use code BRODY, B-R-O-D-I-E, 20 to save 20% on your first order. Now back to the show. 
If if someone's interested in finding whether they have the MTHFR mutation, is that the kind of thing that are is a standard blood test at your doctor's office? Is it 23andMe or some other sort of genetic testing? Like how does how does one go about finding out? You know, I've been doing this for 12 years, and 12 years ago the MTHFR test was fifteen hundred dollars. It was a blood test that had to go to I'm in Connecticut, so it went to one lab, which happened to be Yale University. These days, I mean, you can do a cheek swab and get the test for forty nine dollars. So twenty Three and Me does have the MTHFR SNP. However, it's a two hundred dollar test just to kind of tease out one SNP. In my opinion, would not be financially advantageous. A lot of my patients lately have been using Ancestry.com, which still offers a wider variety of health SNPs. What's going on right now with Twenty Three and Me? For those of you who are interested in looking at that for genetic testing, is is they've made a contract with pharmaceutical companies. They're de-identifying. Ooh data, right? They're taking your name off. But what they are doing is they are specifically targeting SNPs that they're going to use to collect data and then subsequently make pharmaceutical drugs from. So what they have done in the last six months is they took away about 400 SNPs that for those of us that that were really looking at genetics for health implications were really helpful. And they added 500 SNPs that basically are more for geared for the pharmaceutical companies that aren't abundantly useful to us that are really kind of looking for disease risk and things like that. So Ancestry.com seems like the better way to go in terms of genetic testing at this point? Yes. There okay. are a gazillion different companies though right now. There's a company called Origin. There's another one that's called uh, G- Toolbox Genomics. There's at least a half dozen of them. So depending on really what you're looking for, they are easy enough to find. It's a test that anybody could go to the website, pay the money and get the kit and have the information themselves, which I think is useful. What would you say would be the most useful thing to know other than to avoid enriched, quote unquote, foods? Now we're going down the genetic rabbit hole. So uh-huh. it all depends on really what you're looking at. When I first started open pre- my practice 12 years ago, I did 100% pediatrics. And then over the last five or six years, because of my affinity for genetics, what's happening is, is the pediatric patients come in first and then the parents say, well, I gave that kid that bad gene. Exactly, right. <laughs> that must have so, come from somewhere. Exactly. So then they get tested and want to be evaluated. And then sometimes they even see the grandparents, which is to have you know three generations of genetics like in paper in front of you is absolutely fascinating. But there can be huge health risks. Some of the companies will offer testing uh, for the BRCA gene, which we know by research isn't abundantly helpful for breast cancer, Uh, the the genetics for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like that, which for me is not something that I would run out and do. For me, I think the best and most useful information on there is how your body detoxes, right? Because it's not going to be the smartest and it's not going to be the strongest that, you know, continues the race. It's the most resilient. And in that modern society, resilience means our ability to get rid of the toxins that we're swimming in. Heck yeah. And do it effectively without creating disease. Yeah. Do you have a recommendation for like like, detox is a word that gets kicked around a lot and it can mean everything from drinking the, you know, master cleanse spicy lemonade for a week to green smoothies to, you know, the Ayurvedic panchakarma plan to like, there's, there's so many different ways that people quote unquote detox. I'm curious as to what you encourage people to do and how often. You have to remember in my practice, I'm in a like a real hyper niche. So if I were to tell somebody to drink uh, panchakarma or kombucha even, right? Yeah. uh 14 days of kombucha, my patients would be on the floor. They would be so sick. I am generally not a huge kind of, you know, go out and do a five day, 10 day, 12 day detox, you know, kind of thing. What I like to do is I generally like to work along the tenants of the body. So let's get the body really clean. Let's make sure that we're including foods in the diet that we know are supportive to the liver or to digestion or to the gallbladder or or to wherever, you know, the physician has kind of identified the sluggishness for lack of a better word. I have in the past recommended recommended that patients do a bone broth cleanses where they'll drink bone broth and eat steamed vegetables for a couple of days. But as far as advocating for detox, that is certainly not my area of expertise and nor would my patients be able to tolerate it. So in terms of cleaning up the diet, essentially what you mean by that is eating real food? 
Yes, absolutely. Eating real food, perhaps supporting with things that we know advocate for beneficial digestion, possibly digestive enzymes, probiotics, the right vitamin and mineral combination so we can get the right enzymes to work properly in the body. And then maybe at that point, we can add different supplements or suggestions to kind of move things along that that we weren't so particularly happy with storing in our body. Because detox and oxidative stress is a huge problem in people that have you know genetic polymorphisms. So you have to be really kind of careful and you don't want that to build up for sure. And in terms of supporting the liver, liver gallbladder, what are your favorite go-to foods or herbs? It depends on the patient. I mean, I do love ox bile. I think I've used ox bile since I got out of uh, naturopathic school. So I find ox bile to be really effective. I also do love an old school castor oil pack. I don't think any of my patients leave the office without those directions. I also think exercise, you know, which is, what do they say? Exercise is one of the most underutilized medical tools that we have in our arsenal. Because you have to remember, exercise moves the toxicity out of the lymphatic fluid into the circulatory system so the body can get rid of that stuff. Not only that, it raises dopamine and helps increase natural killer cells. So it actually boosts your immune system. So I think people forget, and I, it sounds so naturopath, you waited three months to get into my office and I gave you a paleo diet and some exercises and now you leave and don't come back for three months. But I mean, it really does come down to the day-to-day maintenance of what we're doing to help a constant re-regulation of healing in our bodies for sure. I think that it's so important to emphasize that it really is about the basics. Like we don't need to be outsourcing our health to professionals with, or even like quote unquote detox kits with fancy labels on them from the health food store. It's like we can just clean up our diet eat more plants. We can be exercising and moving our bodies. Even if you can't exercise, like moving your lymph with dry brushing or doing self-massage. These are the kinds of things that that we help bring online in as one of the habits that we (laughs) focus on in my group coaching program, along with getting moving, moving your body and eating more plants. It's the basics and making that autopilot, making that just something that happens Mm -hmm. because it's what we do every day that adds up to how we feel. And if, if we're not detoxing on a regular basis, then it's like you don't actually have to do a massive dramatic cleanse if over time you're just taking things out of your diet that the body doesn't know what to do with. Exactly correct. And you know, I'm sure you have some listeners that are sick, that are chronically ill, right? Indeed. And and they come in the office or they come in my office and then they say to me, you know, my diet's terrible because I feel bad. I don't exercise because I feel bad. I don't sleep because I feel bad. And they go down the whole list. And what I found to be abundantly useful, you know, piggybacking on what you just said is that I say to them, then you know what? Do five minutes of stretching in the morning and five minutes of stretching at night because everybody's got five minutes. And you know, that five minutes will turn into 10 minutes. And then that will help, like you said, move the body, move the lymph, boost the immune system in a very gentle way that meets the patient where they're at. I'm so happy that you just said that because making something non-negotiable but modular is one of my key ways of helping people change habits. It's like, just make this happen. Even if it only happens for five minutes, the days that you have 10, do 10, great, but just make it make it happen no matter what and mm-hmm. start small and build on that success until something is the new normal. Exactly right. Discipline. That's your new discipline. Exactly right. Until you don't need the discipline anymore. You know, right. like then then it's just happens. So autopilot. I want to go back to something that I mentioned in your introduction, right? The four A's, asthma, mm-hmm. autism, allergies, and atopy. I don't even know how to pronounce that word um, or eczema because a lot of people I think might not understand why those four things are in a cluster like right. that. Could you fill us in on the link between those things? This goes back to old school naturopathic tenants from like the mid 1800s. And basically autism, asthma, eczema, and allergies are all things that give us an indicator that the body has what we call a toxic overburden. And so what happens is, is the body is looking for a place to put all of this toxicity. So in asthma, the toxicities in the lungs, you know, mm-hmm. evidenced by the fact that we have high levels of eosinophils, high levels of histamine, and the propensity to cause a bronchospasm. In eczema, the body's pushing all the toxicity out to the skin because it says, well, I'm going to preserve all of my vital organs and you skin can have toxicity as you're the biggest detox organ that we own. Autism is, is very similar. I mean, aut- there's a huge autoimmune component in autism where the immune system is just basically upside down. So the body's looking for a place to store this toxicity. Unfortunately, with kids with autism or adults with autism, that place is in the brain. 
So because the brain is fat, the body identifies fat as a safe place to put toxicity. So we store it in our fat in a little kid, right? The best place to find fat is in their brain and, and, you know, CSF. And as far as allergies go, it's basically any one of the combination of the three that I just discussed. And so they're all the same because the foundation for what we're getting as far as gastric overburden is an inability to process and metabolize toxins and be able to make the most vital thing that we can make in our body, which is glutathione, which protects each and every cell in our body. So they all all are connected. And it's, you know, sometimes I'll have four different patients in the office with four different diagnoses and the same treatment or vice versa. I'll have four patients in the office with the same diagnosis and four different treatments because everybody expresses toxicity in a different way. We have exactly the same principle in Chinese medicine that there can be one cause and a thousand diseases and a thousand diseases with one cause. Oh, I'm going to use that as a quote. (laughs) Yeah, right. Just credit the Chinese classics. I I forget which one, but it's it's something in the medicine. And the the fact that, again, it's that the body is always trying to heal itself. The body is so smart. And so it's trying to make these toxins not kill us, you know, by either shunting it to the surface or stashing it in fat cells or that, and that assisting the body in getting those things out of the body or keeping them under stronger house arrest is going to be really important in, in creating health. And the other piece of that is, especially the in Chinese medicine, we look at as allergies, especially stuff that shows up in the skin. Allergies and asthma are both part of the lungs and that, that the mother of the lungs is the spleen and stomach or the digestive system. And so it's like, again, coming back to the digestive system, our ability to nourish ourselves properly that then supports the functioning of the organ systems down the line. Exactly right. Getting back to this issue of toxicity, Mm -hmm. is there anything in particular that can help us on a daily basis to minimize the effects? Like you mentioned glutathione, for example, Mm -hmm. as being something that is uh, protective. Is is there anything else that we should be thinking about in terms of just like, yeah, like living by a highway, for example, or let's say you do live in California where they're spraying crops and it's everywhere. Is there anything else that we should be thinking about regularly? I think it comes back to bio-individuality. You know, Mm -hmm. if I have patients that live under cell phone towers or live off of a busy street, one of my favorites is alpha lipoic acid. It's the king of all antioxidants and it really helps keep cell membranes intact. Sometimes you just have a family who lives on a farm and they're eating pretty clean and living pretty organically, but still have you know exposure to exogenous toxins. Maybe in that case, probiotics and, and standard probiotics and fish oils might be a good choice for them. Here in the Northeast, we pound down the vitamin D because yes. my goodness, sometimes it feels like the Arctic Circle. Uh, Oregon too, by the way. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> it's just, and now today it's gray. I'm sure it's gray there too. And it's like, oh my goodness. So I think it all depends. And I think that you know, really more than anything else, and this is again going to sound so cliche, is you got to listen to your own intuition. Right now, there's so many people here that are sick with the quote flu. Everybody's yes. got a cough and a wheezing and fever and things like that. And I look at these patients and I think this is just maladaption. I mean, it's just too much stress and too much pollution and not enough access to the right kind of food because it's the Northeast. And, and those patients really need some broth and a good movie and a nice blanket and a fire. You know? Yes. <laughs> And so I think that more than anything else, the takeaway message is really you know, listen to your own intuition and decide for yourself if you feel like you need a little to edge up a little bit on detox or eat some more dark green leafy vegetables or have some oatmeal or whatever it is, because I think really our own intuition is what's going to save us ultimately. I think that's so important that people start trusting their own inner guidance as opposed to, because it can be confusing out there. And sometimes, oh. yet, like, yes, working with a trusted expert is really valuable. And there's a lot that we can just check in with or, or try for ourselves and see how we feel. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that. This has been a super informative chat. Is there anything else that you want to make sure people come away with understanding? I really do think with regard to MTHFR, in a lot of cases, like less is more. I think it's important to get tested. I think it's an easy enough test to do. You know, when I started 12 years ago, I had a lot of doctors that were like, this means absolutely nothing and it's ridiculous. And then, you know, a decade later, most of those physicians are now calling me and referring patients to me. So I definitely think it's, we are talking about it more. It's definitely going to be something going forward that is going to be a huge issue for people who are taking any kind of pharmaceuticals because we've got to make sure that the bodies or any anything for that matter, we've got to make sure that bodies are able to detox things that they shouldn't hold on to. So absolutely. If people are interested in working with you, how can they find you? 
So they can go to my website, which is drkendrabecker.com. I have tons and tons of information on there about um, methylation. I did write a book, which is called The Delicious Way to Heal the Gut, because, you know, we got to heal the gut. And I do have a second book coming out in March, and all that information is on my website. I do do Skype conferences and telephone conferences for patients, and it's kind of a nice place to be. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Kendra Becker Musante, thank you so much for sharing all that you know with our listeners. I really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure. Thank you again, Brody. Thanks for listening today. For more episodes of A Healthy Curiosity, you can visit the iTunes store. If you appreciated today's show, please leave us a review. This helps other people to find the podcast. You could also head to brodywelch.com where you can find free self-care resources, learn more about Chinese medicine, and let me know what you'd like to hear about on future episodes. I'd love to hear from you. Till next time, be good to yourself.